Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast. And this is Bertine Crevacor West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host. Today, I'd like to introduce you to our special guest, Claudia Clark, all the way from Germany. Claudia, can you please say hi to our listeners? Hello, everyone. We are so delighted to have you with us today. And today we're going to be discussing a very special topic, but I first want to tell you all a little bit about Claudia. So Claudia Clark moved from San Jose, California to Lynch, Bavaria in Germany in September 2017, where she currently serves as the National Get Out the Vote, also known as GOTV, Coordinator for Democrats Abroad Germany. She has worked on political and social justice campaigns, including women's reproductive health issues and LGBTQ rights. Additionally, she has served as a campaign manager for a school bond measure for the South San Francisco Unified Schools campaign, as a community organizer with ACORN, as a field organizer for the South Bay Labor Organization in San Jose, California, and as a field organizer for the South Dakota Campaign for Healthy Families. Claudia holds three master's degrees. Yes, everybody, I said three. One is a master's degree in labor and industrial relations. The second is a master's in U.S. history with an emphasis on women's history and a master of social work with an emphasis in community organizing, as well as her bachelor's degree in history and public policy. Claudia, once again, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, we're so delighted to have you. And as I mentioned to you um, off air when we first spoke, um, you and I share a love of political science and political history. And while the Global Fluency Podcast isn't a political show, there's a lot that we can learn from relationships that are based in political history, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Be they from long ago or modern day political history. So I especially found um, your book that you're working on really fascinating um, insofar as exploring relationships, right? And so I want you to tell our guest a bit, I want you to tell our listeners a bit more about your professional background, your training, and what you're doing right now. How did you find yourself going from America to Germany with all of this that you've done here in the in the United States as an organizer? How did that path come about? Well, I'll start with the your first question or your last question first, how I ended up in Germany. This might seem kind of trite and cliche, but when I was five years old and I saw The Sound of Music for the very first time and I saw uh, Julie Andrews wandering around the mountains, I, I I just remember saying, I'm going to live there someday. And I grew up in Michigan, which isn't flat. I, I thought so when I was growing up, I thought it was the most, it was the flattest place in the world. But after, um, I, I just absolutely fell in love with the mountains and I remember saying, I am going to live there one day. And I, and then when I visited, my uncle was stationed in Germany uh, when I was growing up. And when I was a senior in high school, we went to Germany to visit him. And one of the places I insisted that we go was, was Salzburg because my heart was with the sound of music. And I'd never forgotten that. And I stayed true. I, I said, I'm going to live here someday. And when I was in college, I, I had hoped that I could get a job working for the, um, one of the embassies or one of the consulates. But 
as much as I love Germany and the Germans, I don't love the language. I, I struggled <laughs> with the language. And my hus- I convinced my husband, we came back to Germany for our 20th wedding anniversary in 2015. And my husband fell in love with it too. And we we decided on, on Germany rather than Austria because my husband is an engineer and the job market for an engineer was better in Germany. Mm-hmm. And so people often, they don't, often ask why Germany, but it's often, I live about an hour from Munich and people, why Munich, not Berlin? And I always tell people that Berlin is a beautiful city. It is my favorite city in the world, but it's too far from the mountains. Uh And so um, that's how we ended up in Germany. And my husband worked for a company in the state. He worked for Tesla in the States and he had connections. He had friends that were German expats that were working in the States. And he mentioned that we wanted to move to Germany at some point. And they just kind of made some calls and it it kind of just landed in us. You know, we had kind of wanted to wait until we spoke the language better. And, but you know, when opportunities happen like that, you, you don't sneeze at them. You don't wait because you never know when they're going to happen, when they're going to come again. And I, um, with that, I, I knew that I was going to move to Germany. We knew in February, but it was a big move. And we had, there are a lot of ducks you have to kind of get in a row. And I decided to, because of my interest in politics and, and history, I, I knew that I, I still don't speak the language very well. And I knew I was going to have trouble finding a job without speaking German. So I, I wanted something I could do while I was learning my German, while I was learning German, and it was something I could, that would provide me flexibility that I could do either in the States or I could do overseas here just as easily one or the other. And so I just remember I watched the final press conference between President Obama and Chancellor Merkel right after the 2016 election. And I just remember Merkel almost crying. She was so disappointed that that this was going to be their last encounter. So I I started researching saying, well, let's see what what's out there. And much to my surprise, I found so much information, so much material. I was like, okay, and next thing I knew, I had a 250 page manuscript done. So wow. That's a fast, that's a fantastic and fascinating journey. Just just how you all made the decision to really um uproot your lives, right? And mm-hmm go into a completely different place, you know, even though you visited as a child, living and visiting are two different things, right? Right. And, 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 and luckily for us, we could make that move because my husband and I are both only children mm-hmm. and both of our parents are deceased and we don't have children. So we didn't have, and I've got family, because my uncle was stationed here, I do have family in Germany that I, I hadn't seen in, in 30 years. But so I had a little bit of, roots in Germany, but we could ease more easily pick up and move. We didn't, you know, we don't have children to worry about. So it was, let's do it. Oh, I love it. I love that you guys made such a bold decision, right? Um, to really go someplace that, you know, you'd only been partly familiar with. And it was really good to have roots there already, right? Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, you hadn't been there in 30 years. It was great that you would have that connection because I think it's important for us wherever we go um, to have some sort of groundedness, right? Um, it, the expat groups, family members, you right. know, friends that we've not seen in a long time. So I love hearing too that your desire to, to really acclimate to German culture and society led you to really create this this work of art that you've been working on right which is your manuscript and mm-hmm. I will point out too I'm also a, a huge fan of the sound of music and I remember when I was little um, that feeling so that resonates with me deeply that feeling that you got I remember thinking to myself when I saw her on top of the mountain I was like what a beautiful place right so I love that you saw it you made a, a decision in your head even as a small child and you committed to that and you kept your promise to yourself right I think that's particularly important for us as women because a lot of times we let life get in the way mm-hmm. right? so I commend you on on really just keeping that promise to yourself that's a big deal and and I you know I have no regrets well the one regret that there are two. One, I wish we had done it sooner. But I do, in all honesty, I do wish I, I am learning German. But it is, it's, 
I, I speak French and Spanish fluently, but German is a language in of itself. Mm-hmm. And I, most people here do speak English some level, but I do, I, I do wish my German were stronger. And so if, if I had any regrets, I wish my German were better before we had moved over here. Um, but other than, but other than that, I've, I've learned that the German people, they, is, if you make an effort to at least speak the language, they, it, it makes all the difference. And quite often, because most of them do have some level of English, they hear my accent and they, they want to practice their English. And often they will switch to English. And I, many times I have to tell them, I appreciate it, but I need to learn German. You're not helping me by speaking English. So. Understood. But, you know, we do have, when we were talking initially the first time, I remember thinking to myself how we have many parallels, you and I. Mm-hmm. And part of that, though, that I don't know if I got to mention was that because my family is from Haiti and Haiti, we have um, a large uh, group of people with German ancestry. Right. And and mm-hmm. what's ironic is my husband is from Jamaica and his great grandmother was German. And so there's a he's even Carl with a K. So <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a lot of. Um, I, I think in, in Germany as well, um, there's a large group of Haitian people living in Germany, and, and some of them are uh, friends, uh, actually, of my mom's, and mm-hmm. they grew up in Haiti together, and they ended up moving to Germany. And so I, I'm always interested in what prompts people to move and change their lives, but I'm always um, also delighted um, when I consistently and constantly see this relationship um, between my own culture and the German culture. You know, and when I first moved to Atlanta um, as a New Yorker, as a transplant, the first group of people that really, truly embraced me um, was a German coffee clutch that I joined. And (laughs) prior to moving here, I had no idea what a German coffee clutch was. And Uh so it was a really great experience. And they were this lovely group of women. And I keep in touch with them to this day. And it was just a fantastic way to meet a new group of people. Mm -hmm. And honestly, to to hear the German language and learn about the German culture and really to make new friends. So I'm with you on that completely, completely. So now let's talk a little bit about, well, let's talk a lot of it about your manuscript. So tell me you okay so you went to germany and in your endeavor to become you know more closely tied to the german culture the german people and and to learn the german language that led you to writing this book so you were saying how um, miracle when she was uh describing well when she was you know realizing that this was her last time she was going to see president obama in an official capacity mm-hmm. how that resonated with you so what were your next steps then well it it was interesting because i generally if you read the manuscript, you're never going to believe this, but I generally do not watch press conferences because oftentimes the reporters are, and journalists aren't might. So they ask a question and politicians have this art of answering everything but the question. And so you're not <laughs> entirely sure what they're, what they're, and not just politicians, I shouldn't say that. Anytime you watch, you know, if you're watching uh, doctors when they're talking about the coronavirus, same kind of situation. But there was something about, I just happened, I remember I happened to turn on the television and it was that press conference. And I don't know, we hadn't made the official decision to move yet because this was in November of 2016, but I knew we were going to do it at some point. And I, and I don't know if it's because it was Obama and Miracle or it was, I knew Obama was on his way out and I wanted to suck every last second of him I could get. Something prompted me to watch that, that press conference. And that kind of got the wheels turning. And then I was reading journal, newspaper articles and from across the world, Le Monde for, in France, Business Insider, Der Spiegel in uh, Germany. And they, had, they were doing these specials with pictures, you know, 16 pictures that show that Obama and Miracle are really going to miss one another. And I remember I was sitting in a 20th century history, graduate history class, and we were talking about Churchill and FDR, and that books had been written about them because they had been such good friends. So that kind of was in the back of my head. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to start thinking about this. And then this was, you know, November, December of 2016. And then I happened to watch the very first press conference between Merkel and Trump. And it was just the difference between the two of them, just night and day. And not just, it wasn't just my personal 
opinion, but I was I went back to watching I was clips on the internet of journalists were saying they were comparing the picture of, of Obama and Merkel versus Merkel and Trump. And I was like, okay, I'm not the only one that saw that there was something really spectacular between the two of them. And then I think the final straw, or the final thing was President Obama, very first trip overseas after he left office was to Berlin. And it was for, it was the five... 500th anniversary of Reformation. And so there was a big, big uh, to do. And the, the invitation actually came, didn't come from Merkel, actually, it actually came from the church. But it, it was just kind of interesting that, that Obama came and just seeing, again, the fact that he was willing, you know, his very, very first trip overseas after presidency was to see Merkel. And then that was kind of the final, okay, I'm going to see what I can research. And I remember thinking, there may not be anything to what I'm finding out, but but I won't know unless I, I research it. And I'll be honest, there were a couple of times, a couple of hiccups in my research where I thought, oh God, maybe this isn't going to work because the two didn't get off on the best of circumstances. There, there was some discussion about, Merkel didn't want, didn't, wouldn't allow him to speak in front of Brandenburg when he was a uh, candidate. And so that caused a little friction between the two of them. And then there was the issue of Obama uh, wiretapping Merkel's personal cell phone. And that caused Snowden in ex- exile was developed because of that. So there were some hiccups in there. And I, was, and I remember thinking, oh my God, maybe, maybe there isn't anything in here. But as I researched and I looked into it, there, it is true that Merkel and Obama did not start off on, on the best of terms. But as I started researching it, I could see things turning. I could see Merkel thought oh, President Obama was a lot of talk and didn't think he could actually put into action a lot of what he said. But at the same time, Obama was, he had a popularity rate of 85% among Germans. And so Merkel knew that her her people, so to speak, really loved him. And so she had to kind of balance, well, she's suspicious of this man, but she knows, you know, her citizens absolutely love him. And you can see, I won't tell you because I want you to read the book, but you can see the turning point in the relationship. And, and I don't, it was not linear. It wasn't linear. There were a lot of ups and downs in it. For example, the cell phone tapping, that was a major problem. They disagreed. They, they come from two different political parties. Merkel is part of the center right political party in Germany, and their parties are a little different here. So it's not exactly equivalent to the Republican Party, just because mm-hmm. they tend to be a little bit more left-leaning even on the right side. So, uh, But they, they had serious disagreements on a lot of issues, but they worked them out. And not only did they work them out, but more often than not, they ended up stronger together after they had their disagreements and their and their um, arguments. And they and the reason, and this is this is what I argue, is that the reason they were able to do that is because both of them had so much profound respect for not just each other, but for for their own countries. Miracle coming from the former East Germany, she argues and believes very firmly she would not have her freedom were it not for the help from the United States. Mm -hmm. And President Obama just really, and he says it time and time and time again, and I think it's sincere, is that he has so much respect for a woman that was able to come out from the restraints of a communist dictatorship to become the first woman chancellor of a free Germany. And he really respected her for that. And so they, they worked together to through their differences. There is so much to unpack from that gem of a journey that you just gave us. First, I want to touch upon, I love that you pick these two in particular because their relationship is unique. And I love that you mentioned that it didn't start out rosy, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, They didn't have, they didn't see eye to eye. And I think that we can liken that to many situations in life, right? And part of the the purpose and, and the mission of the Global Fluency Podcast is to talk about diverse relationships, right? Every aspect of diversity and relationships being a part of them. But what I love that you mentioned was how they were on 
Well, how they were not necessarily politically aligned insofar mm-hmm. as to which they belonged, right? And mm-hmm. so having said that, it's also important to that you noted, um, and I appreciate you noting this in particular as a, a fan and a student of political history as well. Um, I appreciate that you mentioned that the political parties per se in Germany are different from the ones here in the United States, because I think a lot of times, and this is why I think it's important for people to read, to have conversations, to travel, and to engage with people who are not like-minded, right? Because like-minded doesn't always mean good, and unlike-minded doesn't always mean bad, right? Mm -hmm. And I I think it's it's really important for us to look at politics and political parties in particular as a spectrum. And Mm -hmm. so that this spectrum varies or has variations in different parts of the world, I think that really adds a lot of context to the types of conversations that we can evolve into having, right? Here in the United States, it's, I've noticed this trend where it's left or right, right? Mm -hmm. And um, as an adjunct professor of political science, the way I learned about political science was that straight line, right? That you have left on one side and you have right on the other. And left Mm -hmm. is usually liberal and right is usually conservative and left is usually democratic and right is usually Republican. But the way that, because of my cultural competence background, right? The way that I teach political science is more of a bell curve, right? Um, Because it is that spectrum. And I think that's more representative of what we see here in reality, right? What we see throughout the world. So to liken the German right party as something being along the bell curve, kind of in the middle almost, Mm -hmm. right? I think that gives our listeners uh, a broader perspective of what political parties are actually like outside of, of the noise that we hear. Right. And Uh I think once we understand that, you mentioned that, you know, they were their relationship, Merkel and and Obama evolved over time because of their communication with one another. Right. And I think Uh understanding each other's perspectives leads us to have a better communication. Uh Right. And then that leads to a better relationship. So Uh I really one of the reasons why I thought you'd be great as a guest besides your your book topic being so fascinating, was that it's exploring those basic communications between people as the building blocks for for improving inclusion, political, um, personal, interpersonal relationships, and otherwise. We've got some exciting news here at the Global Fluency Podcast. As your safety and continued learning remains our top priority, the 2020 Global Fluency Diversity and Inclusion Summit has gone virtual. The Global Fluency Podcast and Westbridge Solutions continue to see this as a time for growth and evolution. Take this opportunity to come join us virtually for our 2020 summit from the comfort of your own home. Going virtual has allowed us to offer all summit attendees tons of additional perks. When you register for the summit, you will receive access to all 12 of our key speakers during this live two-day summit. No need to choose breakout sessions. 30-day access to the replay of the summit with closed captions. Eligibility for SHRM, CCHI, NBCMI, and LPCA CEU credits. And for nonprofit organizations and interpreters, you will receive a special discount when you use code GF202045. Don't delay. Register today at www.globalfluencysummit.com. We look forward to seeing you at the virtual event. And and one thing that that I bring home is one of the things. Okay, I'm an American. I you know I'm proud to be an American, but I do think that Americans often tend to be very self-centered and just assume that. The world kind of revolves around them and they expect because we're the most powerful nation in the world that when we speak, other nations, including allies, just kind of drop what they're doing. And one thing that helped break the ice between Obama and Merkel was that, and I talk about this, this is early, early, their very, very first phone conversation after President Obama had been elected was they know there was a Analysts and pundits realized that one thing that was different between that the conversation between Obama and Merkel was that there were a lot of pauses on Obama's end because he wasn't just dictating, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. 
but he listened and said and then there was a lot of concern that he he was going to demand that Germany and other European um, allies send more troops to Afghanistan. And there's a lot of speculation on whether that was going to happen. But Obama didn't do that. And he listened to Merkel. And the quote that I use to, to talk about this particular issue is the United States no longer wanted to be a skunk at the garden party because they had this reputation of we're the United States, we're the best, you're going to cater to us regardless. And another time that that comes into play where I think it's really, really important is when when they were trying to mend fences after it was learned that Obama had had tapped Merkel's cell phone. Now, I think he was wrong. I will be the first to admit that he was wrong to do so. And when it was brought, when knowledge came about it, the way they, they, one of the biggest things they did to fix that was rather than having Merkel's staff members, her, her chief of staff, rather than expect him to drop everything and go to the United States, go to Washington to fix everything, Obama sent his chief of staff over and said, here, you fix this. And that made all the difference. It was, okay, you guys were wrong. We were wrong. We will fix this. We're, we don't expect you to revolve around us. And that, and there were a couple of articles I, I used for my research that stated that was one of the biggest, most important things Obama could have done to fix that relationship. And it's so simple. It's things you don't, you don't even think about. It, all, it, all it did was say, okay, I'm going to send someone and let them spend nine hours on a plane. And, and that's all. It, I, I, it's, I'm oversimplifying, but it wasn't all it took. It took a lot of negotiations behind the, the scenes. But the fact that he was willing to even do that, I, I think it says volumes. I love that in how he took, he allowed some space between the conversation, right? Because I think, and I'm, I'm quoting a friend and colleague, Dawn Christian on this, she introduced me to the idea of psychological safety. And that's had a great impact upon my work. And now I realize, because before I didn't have that term, but now I realize opportunities where we create psychological safety for people, right? And I think in that sense, when President Obama was taking those pauses, he was creating psychological safety, but political safety as well, right? And also, it's really important that we do give women the opportunity to speak, because by far, our research has shown us that women get interrupted so much more often than men do. Mm -hmm. And so to see that in a political sphere, especially from uh, the United States' stance, right? Because we, mm -hmm. we are known here and we think of ourselves as such, right? American exceptionalism. This is something that, that's prevalent and honestly ingrained in the mind of every American child going to school, right? But as the child of immigrants, you know, I, I have a dual perspective on this. I do think... I do think what, especially what I'm seeing here in the world currently happening right now is, well, at least in America, you know, people conflate wanting, like when you criticize America, people conflate that with not loving America. And that to me is just, it's such a false narrative that's being created. And so mm -hmm. I think America became this wonderful place because of criticism, because of pushing back on power because of questioning, right? And because mm -hmm. of having conversations that make us uncomfortable and difficult. And maybe difficult. And, you know, I, as, as a child of immigrants, I completely see the dream, you know, of America as that shining beacon. But I also, as an American, believe fundamentally in the Constitution, which allows us to pose these questions, right? Because the Constitution, I always like to say, is a living, breathing entity, right? It mm -hmm. changes like language, right? It's ever evolving. And so we mm -hmm. have to consistently shift our mindsets and understand, or at least I will say we have to shift our mindset to understand that it's constantly evolving. So therefore I question and I disagree about things that I, and I don't always agree with things our country does because I love our country. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a part of that conversation has been lost somewhere along the line. So this is why I love, again, that you decided to write a book like this and talk about these things because they're not talked about enough, I think. I think we talk politics a lot, but we don't talk about 
of the historical context, you know, the cultural mm-hmm. competency associated with political discussion, um, right. relationships that exist politically, right. and what those things actually mean. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity that these leaders took and that he sent his own chief of staff there, that he extended that olive branch. It wasn't something he had to do, but that also makes us see that it's important for us not to care about being right or wrong, but to take proactive steps as opposed to reactive ones, right? Uh-huh. Um, so that, that doing that really, I think, adds so much more to that relationship. And like you said, even if it's a simple, a simplified example, you know, it that's what it takes though. Simple steps, not easy steps, but simple right. steps, right? And so I want to ask you, Claudia, like with your research, because this seems like a huge undertaking, how long did it take you to research this? It took me probably, oh, let's see, I started, it's interesting because I I initially was going to just see what was out there and then actually start writing it once we moved. But I was so interested, so I started in April of 2017. And much to my husband's dismay, I started I started actually working on it before we moved. So my notebooks and notebooks of materials had to be moved with us. So um so I started it in August or April of 2017 and then uh, I think I turned it over to an editor, my first editor to get it ready to go to a publisher. I want to say February or March of 2018. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's a significant amount of time. And that you had to bring it all with you too, I know is no small feat. No. Yeah. It, and then it's one of those things. And I learned this when I was working on my history master's thesis. It's just every single time you think, oh, I've got all the research I need. I don't need anything more. You read something or you see something in passing and you just, I can't let this go. So you have to start. Wow. Uh, start. And and even now I um I mean, with the the whole coronavirus situation, I rewrote, I just turned over another in addition to the, to my publicist a couple of weeks ago because she wanted because it hasn't been published yet, she wanted me to include that to make sure it was really it was as current and up to date as it could be. So even now, when I you know, I've, I think a hundred times, oh, it's done. I'm not writing another sentence. That you're going to get it, and that's it. I've I probably changed it fifty times after that. So I believe that. I believe that because we always think that it's done, and then there's that little tidbit that could be huge, right? Mm-hmm. That we don't want people to miss. So so with regard to writing it itself, um, beyond the research, how long did the actual writing process take you? That probably took me. Maybe a year, because I am meticulous and I rewrite and I rewrite and I rewrite. So uh, it probably took me 18 months because I was I was doing research in addition to when I was writing. I would research for one chapter and then I would write it. And while I was waiting for, while I was letting my writing sit, while I could think about it and other, I was researching for the next. So all told, it was probably took about two years. Wow, that's such a significant amount of time. But for a book of this this magnitude, I would think so. Yeah, and and that that has to be a lot of yourself that you're pouring into this work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is into a huge move. <laughs> so right and and it was interrupted. And a lot of it was I was stalled for when we first moved to Germany. I was stalled for. I don't know, a couple months because I just, I, I was having trouble refocusing and getting myself back on track. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just not culture, a little culture shock, a little trying to get used to my surroundings. So throwing that into the mix didn't help matters any, but. I can imagine. I can imagine. So let me ask you this, Claudia, what would you like to see once the book is published? What shift would you like to see occur in the conversations people that are having? What do you want them to come away thinking once you once you've put the book into the world? What do you want them to come away feeling, thinking, talking about? My my thesis on the book is twofold. One was the personal relationship between President Obama and Chancellor Merkel. And that I that kind of that is your feel-good, happy kind of 
something that you that that I think you know my my publicist said a good nonfiction book should have three components. It should inspire, it should educate, and it should and if you're lucky, it should it should make people laugh or smile. And I'm talking about some really dry topics like the Russia Ukraine thing was brutal and I hated writing those chapters because it was dry. So I so I would try to put anecdotes in there that would make people smile every once in a while. So that's one thing that I that I think is important. But the other thing is is the thesis that world in a globalized world like we live in now with climate change with um, terrorist attacks. You know, somebody can set off a bomb in Belgium from their home in, in San Francisco, you know, that kind of thing. We really, really, really need to rely on our allies and having the kind of relationship that, that Obama and Merkel had. And I am just, it's very concerning to me when I see a couple of years ago, all the, the G7 leaders were in Ottawa, in, in Canada, and Trump took two pieces of candy out of his packet and threw it at, at Chancellor Merkel and kind of walked away in a huff. And now she's she's quoted as saying in an article when she was talking to Chan, um, French President Macron that she doesn't even want to be in the same room with Trump. And it's, number one, it's bad relations for, for countries. But I my fear is what happens if we, there are some people that are planning another 9-11 and say, for example, somewhere we wouldn't expect, say, Houston. And people, our allies, they have intelligence and they know that. But our, our relationship is so severed with our allies that nobody's going to tell us about that. And I think, or, or conversely, there's something that could happen in, say, Hamburg. And we know, but because Merkel refused Trump's or anyone, uh, Trump just happens to be the one in, in power right now, but invitation because our relationship is so severed, that's just going to create more animosity and in that interconnected as we are in this world, that that's dangerous. And so I want people to, I want us to go back to, okay, so no, nobody has to be as close as Merkel and Obama. Nobody's arguing that they had an extraordinary good relationship. But there has to be back to, to some civility to the point where they can share information without it being leaked that she, so-and-so thinks someone is crazy and therefore they're not going to listen to the intelligence information, that kind of thing. And unfortunately, I think that's where we are now. And I just think that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I do agree with you that relationships have, political relationships in particular, based on interpersonal differences, can have real long-term, long-lasting implications for all of us, right? right? And so that that is why, again, I think it's so wonderful that you want to highlight a relationship and how it benefited us because we have lessons to learn from that. We mm -hmm. have lessons to learn about allyship and honestly performative allyship and, and what it means to be an ally. Because I think, uh, especially now, we're hearing that word used so often and so many times and and people don't know how to be allies, right? It's not yeah. something that is innate in some people. And that I think is fine. But if if we want to, what did Gandhi say? Be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So if we want people to serve as allies, you know, we have to give them the criteria on what is a good ally. And that changes with the person needing the allyship, right? So what might make you a good ally for me? I might need something else to be a good ally to someone else based upon their needs. So I think allyship is, is really important. And I love that you're, you, you, you said your editor said that you have to write a, a piece of work that would inspire, educate, and, and do provide a good feeling, right? Um, because mm -hmm. although political relationships and political history are fascinating to me and you, right? How are we going to bring in that person that isn't fascinated by it? What right. would they get from, from reading this work? So I love that your goal was threefold. And so most importantly, tell us the name of the book. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, 
healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Okay, um, the name of the book, and then I'll tell you how I got to that name in, um, afterwards. But the working title, which I've been told not to get too attached to, but um, my partner, my friend, the relationship between President, U.S. President Obama and German Chancellor Dr. Merkel, Angela Merkel. And the reason I, how I came about with that title is after the manuscript was done initially, the 250 pages plus 100 pages of references, I looked, I kind of did a, a search in Word and just word count and that kind of thing. And I was looking at, and the phrase and sentence that came up more than anything else throughout the manuscript was my partner and my friend. And more often than not, it was President Obama, but towards the end, Miracle Loss will use that quite often. And, and I talk about this to the extent I, I can. There are cultural differences between the U.S. and Germany. And the U.S. is more willing to use the term friend. And they're, they're a lot more formal in Germany than they mm-hmm. are in the United States mm-hmm. in, in everything. And so up front, Obama was more willing to refer to Merkel as his friend and his partner. But Merkel eventually does. And so that was what I thought was the most telling thing was that they referred to each other as, as partners and friends and you couldn't, there wasn't a time, I don't think later on and earlier in the, in the, the relationship, it was, it wasn't quite so much, but where they didn't refer to one another that way. And so I thought that was the appropriate title. Wow. What a lovely story. What a lovely evolution into your title, because I know that that sometimes can be the bane of an author's existence trying to, you know, find a phrase, a title, a subtitle that encompasses, you know, the totality of their work. That can be right. challenging. So I, I love your journey on that. It's it's a little long and I am kind of worried they're going to make me ax it a little bit, but but I'm, I'm going to fight for it. Do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fight for it. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. So as we're wrapping up right now, I want you to share with us two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners. I think one of the things I liked, what I found the most intriguing about about the relationship, and it's something that they found very intriguing about about the relationship. Miracle does not, like a lot of the feminists do not particularly like Miracle because they don't think she she does not call herself a feminist and she kind of stays away from that train of thinking. Um, and there are some some women that don't think she's done enough for the women's movement. I don't look at, I only looked at her international policy, so I, I don't want to engage in that. But one thing that I do think is just amazed me is that you had the, the fact that both President Obama was the first African-American president of the United States. That is big. And his incredible, he rose to fame so fast. That is unheard of. And similarly, Merkel, she had, she was the first uh, woman chancellor of Germany. And she was the first woman from the former East Germany. And she probably, looking at things now, she's probably going to be the only one. uh, But who knows? But she was also the youngest when she was... So the fact that they, and she also rose, she went from, her, her rise to fame was actually a lot faster than pres, even President Obama's. And so I think the fact that they shared this bond because they were the first of everything, you know, the first African-American and the first woman chancellor, I think says something. And I, I want that to be, that part I want to be inspirational. I want somebody to be able to read that and say, wow, they were both were able to do this. And more than that, in today's polarized world, you know, as I'm doing research, as I'm trying to promote the book and I'm looking at what people want, I think one of the biggest problems with American society right now is the loss of civility. It's you're either 
if you support Trump on anything, you're wrong. If you support the, you know, if you're a Trump supporter and you if you support the left on anything, you're wrong. And that didn't used to be the case. Politics used to be about compromise. And I think I talk a lot about the differences that the two had, especially on economic issues. You know, they they worked together with the they had to work together through the um the Great Recession of the early 2000s. And they had total disagreements. They didn't agree. And, you know, in one press conference on, on one issue, Merkel pretty much told Obama to mind his own business. You know, I mean, she was you know, <laughs> paraphrasing it a little bit. But, yeah. but, but it was, despite their differences, they, they came together, they worked together. They, and, and I really think that rather than faulting someone for working with the other side, like, what is happening in the United States right now, and it's some fractions in, in Europe as well, but rather than faulting for someone and criticizing them and using that as a campaign ad against your opponent, this so-and-so, you can't trust them. They worked with, with the Republicans on this, so that we need to get away from that. And, and so I'm hoping people, when they read this book, they'll realize that you can still work with somebody who you with whom you disagree and still have something, come up with something, keep your integrity intact and own your mistakes when, when necessary, but look at the brighter picture. I love that. Part. I really do love that. And I couldn't agree with you more. I do believe and I concur that we need a return to civil discourse right? Um, we need a return to good old-fashioned etiquette, in my opinion, right? And and that might look different to some people from what they've grown accustomed to, because I feel as if, you know, we're, we're so used to seeing things now devolve that we've become accustomed to the de-evolution of the conversation, right? Uh-huh. We, as, as political history has shown us, and as your book will further highlight, you can agree to disagree and still come out cordial, still come out respecting the person, still come out even being friends with that person, right? right? Well, and, and that is a really important key. And, and I think one of the reasons how we've gotten away from that is back in the, I guess, it's the 70s and the 80s in the United States, kids used to, the Republican kids used to go to the same school as their Democratic kids. And so the kids all played on the same baseball team. And so, you know, at the end of the day, they could let it go. And that just unfortunately doesn't happen anymore. And it's it's a shame. It really, it really is a shame. And and I I and that's part of the reason. I always say the Global Fluency Podcast started for selfish reasons on my part and continues to be so because I enjoy having these conversations and I want to share these conversations. And I hope that our listeners, you know, people that disagree with one another on a multitude of, of platforms, right? But and a multitude of issues, but I, I really do hope that that these conversations um, inspire people because not right. only is it good for us to expand our, our networks, you know, and have these conversations because you're in Germany right now and I am in the U.S. and, and mm-hmm. specifically in Atlanta. And, you know, I, I really love that we can have this kind of reach, right? That we can mm-hmm. meet one another on at least virtually and sit down for basically a cup of coffee and, right. and engage each other in this. And, and hopefully instead of fire. Yeah. Instead of blocking someone because they disagree exactly. with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I dare say, you know, when, again, we do create that, that space, because that's what your book is, is that's what's resounding with me with your book is that those two created a space for one another and they learned to communicate. And, and that required some difficulties and a lot of hurdles, you know, if I'm going to simplify it. And at the end of the day, they built an allyship that, that's been enduring. Right. And I do believe that that we can do this in the world and we can do this in the United States. And and I I'm really excited for your book to come out. So tell me when will uh, when do you anticipate uh, that the book will be released? I am hoping I've got agents reviewing the manuscript as we speak. So I am hoping I hoped by the 2020 election, but that isn't going to happen. So I'm my goal is maybe March. Okay. Okay. So hopefully March, 2021, everybody will have a copy in their hands. This is what I'm hoping for you. If you, if you want to help ensure that I, it gets published, if you go to my website, 
Yes. Tell us where we can find you on your social media platforms as well. ClaudiaClarkAuthor.com. And if you uh, sign up for updates, I promise I won't spam people. Um, you can actually download a free chapter of the book, which is actually the, the chapter, which I think is it's a kind of a long chapter, but it is I, I selected it because it is the turning point of their, of their relationship. So the website is ClaudiaClarkAuthor.com. And I am on Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is Claudia Clark Author 73. And Twitter, I think, is C Clark Author. So you'll be able to find anything. And so. people can also connect with you on LinkedIn if they have any follow-up questions for you. Absolutely. Wonderful. So Claudia, I've been just enjoying this conversation with you. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for coming on and sharing your journey about your research and, you know, publishing your book and really this, this most interesting and fascinating topic. So we appreciate you. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. It is my pleasure. It is my pleasure. So everyone, as we wrap up yet another awesome episode of the Global Fluency Podcast, I encourage you all to keep the conversation going at your virtual water coolers, at your in-person water coolers. If you're gathering right now, keep social distancing going (laughs) and and really continue the conversation. And remember, this is your podcast. So send us any questions you might have at um, info at westgrouptraining.com. Follow us on Facebook. We are at the Global Fluency Podcast on Facebook. You can also follow us on um, westgrouptraining.com. That is our website as well as Westbridge Solutions on Instagram, Westbridge Solutions on Facebook. And you can always reach me, Bertine Krabacore West, on LinkedIn as well. So again, Claudia Clark, thank you for being a part of our show today. And for all of you out there, let's remember, keep the conversation going. Until next time. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.